Uh, good morning to all, uh, dear students and uh, respected madam and sir. So I would like to introduce uh, today's resource person. So today's uh, resource person identified is Dr. Ipsita Samuel. She is currently working as assistant professor of entomology in faculty of agriculture at Sri uh, University, Kattak, Odisha. Uh, she has completed her MSc, agree, uh, MSc degree and her PhD degree at IRA New Delhi and her graduation from College of Agriculture, uh, Bhavani Patna from Odisha. Uh, she has also published two books for JRF, SRF, ARS, NET aspirants, namely Insights on Entomology and Insights on Insect Physiology. She is an awardee of ICR, ICR JRF, uh, then ICR, NET, and IRI PhD in Entomology. And uh, recently, uh, she was awarded with Dr. Guru Prasad, Pradhan Memorial Award from I, uh, ICR IRI as the best student of Department of Entomology IRI New Delhi. So hearty congratulations, madam. And uh, <laughs> so we are really very fortunate to uh, have such a esteemed and uh, scholar person as a resource person for today's lecture. So I welcome on behalf of uh, MPKV Rahuri and Department of Extension. I welcome you, madam, for today's lecture session. So, Madam, please, you have already shared the screen. So, can we start the presentation? Yes, ma'am, sure. Okay, thank you, thank Madam. You. So, good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is on biological control. Am I audible? Yes, Madam, you are ma am I audible? Madam, can you start okay. in PowerPoint mode? No, no ma'am, actually it's not. I have all okay, put it to PowerPoint mode, but it's not working. So I'll go with, uh, like manually I'll operate. There is no animation. So I think it will be okay. Yes, madam, no problem. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. So uh, biological control, today's lecture is on biological control. And uh, basically for uh, like different exam perspectives, if we like uh, uh, what are the important terms under this uh, topic? Like first is on uh, one term is your biological control. Another one is on natural control. So how the biological control become the natural control? It is the concept here. Uh, first time, uh, Dr. H.S. Smith, 1999, he used the term biological control to signify the use of natural enemies means it is manipulated uh, use of natural enemies. Like artificially, we have to uh, deliver the natural enemies to control the pests. But the term, if we uh, think, like he is known as the father of biological control in the year 1964. He refined the term it from natural control and from the biological control. Because we know that there are some um, natural enemies present in the field. So if they will control your pest, that is your natural control. But if uh, we are artificially providing any kind of natural the field or we are uh, undergoing through introduction, inundation or augment conservation practices, that type of uh, control or management is known as the biology. So natural control is the maintenance of more or less fluctuating population density organism within a certain defined level, upper and lower limit. Like we know that already there is some natural enemy in the field. So if uh, the, suppose we consider that the natural enemy is coccinellid bitter. So if the coccinellids, they are naturally controlling the aphids in the mustard field. So that is the example of natural control. But again, if we come to the biological control, it is a term from the ecological viewpoint where uh, it is basically, uh, it uh, denotes the action of parasitoid predators and parasites as well as pathogens in maintaining another organism's population level at a lower average than would occur in their absence. So this, at a lower average, this term denotes your economic threshold level. So basically, biocontrol agents, they will uh, make the insect population or the base population below the ETL. 
So, uh, based on these two terms, Van den Bosch in the year 1982, he has introduced one more term that is your applied biological control uh, as the manipulation of natural enemies by man to control the pest and natural biological control as a control that occurs without man's intervention. As I told that, if there is man's intervention, it is known as your applied biological control or else only biological control. But if it is occurring naturally, so it is known as your natural control. So uh, again, if we come to what is the applied biological control, it can be broken down into three major categories. So first one is the classical biological control. Second one is the augmentation of natural enemies. Third one is the conservation of natural enemies. So like classical biological control, it is the control of pay species by introduced natural enemies. Suppose we know that uh, fall army one, that is uh, Spodoptera frizipara, is an uh, introduced paste in India. So if as it is a invasive paste in India, so naturally its natural enemy is not occurring in India. So obviously we have to import it from its origin or from other uh, places where it has earlier invaded. So if we are introducing any kind of natural enemies of Spodoptera frizipara, from outside, that is an example of classical biological control, or else we can uh, simply we can say it is introduction. The second term is your augmentation of natural enemies. So under augmentation, augmentation basically denotes uh, like our uh, increasing in the efficiency of a natural enemy. So when the efficiency of a existing natural enemy will increase, that term is known as augmentation. So the action taken to increase the population or beneficial effects of natural enemies. So basically it is of two types. One is your inundation. Another one is your inoculation. So inundation means here the control is expected from the progeny, not from the release itself. But in the inoculation, it is uh, from the uh, release itself, not from the progeny. So basically these are two different things that are coming under your augmentation. Similarly, the third aspect that is our conservation. So conservation of natural enemies, like here we'll uh, go for habitat management, like whatever the agro ecosystem we are having, like uh, the cropland we are having, we are trying to adopt intercropping uh, or trap cropping. So we'll diversify the cropping system so that the conservation of natural enemies can happen. So the pre-mediated actions proposedly taken to protect and maintain population of natural enemies. So basically in the field it, itself, we'll go for some in-situ or ex-situ conservation measures to conserve the natural enemies. Like we'll uh, plant trap crops or else we'll plant different uh, pollinator harboring crops so that the natural enemies will be maintained in the off-season also. So these are the three different basic aspects of uh, applied biological control. So uh, what are the major types of organisms that are targeted for classical biological control? Mainly uh, the different uh, biological control agents or biocontrol agents in short, we can say, uh, they are targeting arthropod paste, weed species, other vertebrates, snails, algae, fungi, and trees also, and even the animal byproducts also. So these are the different targets of classical biocontrol agents. And if we come to uh, what are the types of natural enemies like pathogens, predators, and parasitoids, they are coming under different uh, types of natural enemies. Like uh, uh, if we consider the pathogens, so different viruses, bacteria, either directly or by producing the toxins, they will cause the damage to the paste insect. And similarly, uh, different protozoans, fungi, as well as entomopathogenic nematodes are also coming under different natural enemies. So the next two terms are a predator and parasitoid. So predator, it is an animal that feeds up other animals. That is, in case of predator, the host is known as your prey that are either smaller or weaker than itself. But if we come to parasitoid, here the host is known as your, uh, here we usually call the prefer the host term. So uh, a parasitic insect that lives in or on and eventually it kills a larger host insect. So basically the parasitoids are smaller in size and quite specific in their feeding habit. And if we come to the predator, they are quite generalistic in appearance and they are um, like larger than their prey. So the difference between the predator and parasitoids later we'll discuss uh, in detail. 
so what are the advantages of uh, biological control so basically uh, like we know that uh, there are different methods of control and or management waste management under the ipm so first is like your physical methods mechanical method, methods and cultural methods and also uh, then coming your biological method and then at last chemical control methods so chemical con control methods are usually not uh, that much easily uh, advisable because we know that the three r concept like uh, resistance resurgence and uh, residue so how they are uh, hampering the waste population as well as the environment that's why in this context what are the advantages of biological control one should suggest or uh, uh, we should uh, prefer for research and extension activities so basically uh, there are five important advantages like high level of waste control at low cost because we know that pesticides are costly so uh, in spite of the pesticides one can suggest to go for biological control agents again uh, one demerit is here like the biocontrol agents that are uh, not easily establishable because they will need some time and uh, they, they their perpetuation and multiplication highly dependent on the uh, environmental factors so that is one uh, limitation we can say uh, again is self perpetuation at the little or no cost following the initial effort like if one farmer is applying in the uh, trichogramma in the rice field so it will be self perpetuating like you don't have to go and apply at each space because they biocontrol agents they are leaving and mobile so they will move throughout the field by themselves next is almost total absence of harmful effect so harmful effect here it uh, includes like uh, as i told three r resistance residue and resurgence so these three r's they will uh, they are almost absent in the case of biocontrol agents because uh, i think there is no record of any kind of resistance resurgence or residual effect of any biocontrol agent on the environment or the pest so next is our utility of some types of biocontrol agents as biotic insecticides because we know that bt is an biocontrol agent uh, that is coming under a pathogen or microbial control we can say but it is again uh, different bt crops or different formulations have been developed that are acting as biotic insecticides so next is our general inability of paste to develop resistance to biocontrol agents like i told uh, there is a uh, different uh, chemicals uh, have been uh, already uh, proven and uh, already documented uh, like insects have developed resistance to different chemicals like overuse of chemicals had led to the development of resistance resurgence type issues but in case of biocontrol agents these have not been uh, till now these have not been recorded so these are some of the advantages of adopting biological control in your field so with these advantages uh, as a entomology student or as, as an entomology aspirant you can suggest farmers to go for the biological control as well so yes this is the most important part uh, of biocontrol because uh, since uh, his, our historical times the biocontrol has been well developed and uh, here i'll cite some of the important examples like these are important from your uh, exam and multiple uh, choice type point of views like later on at the end of the presentation uh, we'll be discussing few important objective questions uh, related to all the uh, biocontrol aspects but uh, these uh, are some of the important historical developments that one should know like in the year 900 ad the first use of red ant that is ecophylla smaragdina to control the leaf chewing insect on the mandarin trees was documented similarly in the year of 1602 andrew handy noted that the hymenopteran parasite that is apentelis glomeratus it is uh, laying eggs on the pupa of cabbage butterfly that is your pyris brassica so this is the first noted example of a parasitoid this is the first noted example of an uh, predator that is red ant next is uh, in the year 1726 the first insect pathogen was recognized and noted by d rumor so it was a cordyceps fungus on a noctuid moth so first we can say this is the first noted example of a predator second one is the first noted example of a parasitoid third one is the first noted example of a pathogen so these three along with the years also when it was recorded uh, these three points are important next is your 1762 this uh, year marks the 
uh, importance of Indian minor word that is Gracula religiosa because it was exported from India to Mauritius to control the red locust that is Nomadacris septem faceta. So we uh, already we have acquainted on we are aware of the damage and the devastation caused by the migratory locust in the last uh, few years. So you can see how Indian minor bird that is Gracula religiosa that is uh, one, we can say that it is an avian mediated pest control because it is a bird, it is not a parasitoid uh, or it is not a predator. It is a avian predator, we can say. So uh, in the year 1762, uh, minor bird was exported to Mauritius. Next is your, in the year uh, 1776, uh, the control of bed bug, that is Simex lecturalis, uh, it was successfully accomplished by the release of predatory pentatomid, that is Picromerus biddens in Europe. Uh, so most important case that is in the year 1888, Vedalia beetle, that is Rhodolia cardinalis, it was brought from Australia and introduced into California to control cottony cushion scale. So Californian cottony cushion scale, uh, they are uh, feeding on the citrus trees. So the first well-planned and successful classical biological control was uh, the introduction of Vedalia beetle from Australia to California. So we'll discuss this case study in detail because it is uh, most important from the JRF SRF as well as from net point of view. Because in the year 1868, the cottony cushion scale, it was introduced into California and uh, in the 1887, you can see nearly within 20 years, it spread throughout the Southern California. So that time the Californian government, they have realized uh, how the importance of uh, damage caused by cottony cushion scale. So after that, they have appointed CV Relay or uh, Charles Valentine Relay, the chief uh, of the division of entomology in the USDA. And again, he employed Albert Goebelin as well as Dr. D.W. Coquillet in the research on control of cottony cushion scale. And uh, they found no methods to control because they have explored in the nearby places and they couldn't found any effective uh, method to control it. And uh, gradually what happened in the year 1888, because uh, the cottony cushion scale has been introduced from Australia to California. So CV Relay, the chief of the uh, project, he thought that the natural enemies might be present in the uh, origin of the paste itself. So that's why he sent Albert Coebele uh, to Australia to collect the natural enemies of the scale insect. And what happened? Uh, he searched for the natural enemies and he found and he sent 12,000 individuals of Cryptochetum iseri as well as 129 individuals of Rhodolia cardinalis, that is the Vedalia beetle. And gradually they have found that both these beetles, uh, both these insects, they have been found to control the uh, cottony cushion scale on Isolia purchase. So this is the first successful introduction example. And this is most important from the point of view of uh, GRF, SRF, as well as other exams. So uh, coming to the Indian case study, like this is an international one throughout the world, we can say. But if we come to India, after 10 years, like in the year 1888, uh, it was introduced into California. Then after 10 years, in the year 1898, it was introduced into Australia, India, we can say from Australia. So Australian Cryptolemus montrosieri, uh, it was introduced to India to control coffee green scale, that is the Cocos viridis. So in both cases, we can see, uh, in case of wild case study, the paste was cottony cushion scale. But in case of Indian case study, the paste was your Cocos viridis. So uh, there are some other important examples like in, in India, like in the year uh, 1920, a parasitoid Aphelinus mali, it was introduced from England to India to control uh, only apple aphid, that is Erosoma lanigerum. And after 10 years, like in the year uh, 1929 to 31, Rhodolia cardinalis, it was imported from India, into India from USA to control cottony cushion scale, Isaria purchasing. Like, but then uh, 1947, the Commonwealth Bureau of Biological Control was established. So here it marks the establishment of one organization particularly dedicated to biological control. Like we can say in India, it is the PDBC earlier and now it is the NBAIR, that is your National Bureau of Agriculture Insect Resources. Uh, so uh, similarly, in case of uh, uh, in the international scenario, if we see it is the CIBC, CBBC, that is your Commonwealth Bureau of Biological Control. So uh, in the year 1947, when India got independent, it was established in the worldwide. 
But in the year 1951, the CBBC was renamed at CIBC, that is Commonwealth Institute for Biological Control. And the headquarters of uh, CIBC are currently situated at Trinidad West Indies. And later on in the year 1955, we can say 1955, it was renamed as CILB. So all these uh, three instit renamed institutes are coming under your importance of different exam point of view, we can say. So in the year 1962, the CILB was again renamed into IOBC, that is International Organization for Biological Control. So you can see the chronology here, like CBBC, then it was renamed as CIBC, then it was again renamed as CL CILB, then again it was renamed as IOBC. So these four years, as well as the four institutes uh, that have been renamed, so are uh, of equal importance. Like you have to remember all the institutes for objective point of view. Next, uh, next is your, like uh, different uh, weed control agents uh, that have been insect have uh, been act as different weed control agents. Like in the year uh, 1795, the cochineal insect, Dactylopius salonicus, it was introduced from Brazil against the carmine dyes producing the insects uh, that is the Dactylopius coccus. So next one is the exotic weevil that is your uh, Cetobagus salvini. It was imported from Australia against uh, the uh, water fawn we can say that is Salvinia mollusca in the lily pond in Bangalore. And three exotic natural enemies were introduced that is Neochatina bruchi, Neochatina acorni, as well as your calumnid mite that is orthogram calumna terebrantis against the water hyacinth. So we can see how the weed, aquatic weed, we can like uh, water pond, then uh, water hyacinth, they have been controlled by the insects. So these are the best examples of um, weed control by insect uh, parasitoids. Then next is the coccinellid beetle, that is Rhodolia cardinalis. It was uh, imported against cottony cushion scale, that is your Isidia perchigi. Similarly, the uncited parasitoid, that is Leptomastix dactylopi, against uh, Planococcus citri, as well as Planococcus linus sinus from the Trinidad, it has been imported for, to control the uh, like citrus scale. Then next is your uh, like uh, a chrysomelid beetle that is Jagogramma bicolorata. It has been effective in controlling Parthenium wheat. That is, we know already an established wheat in the mustard field. So uh, the coccinellid predator also like the Curinus querulens, it has been uh, effectively used against Heterocella cubana from Thailand. Similarly, a uh, few different examples like agromizer seed fly, that is Ophiomia lantani against lantana camera, tinger lace bug, that is Telonomia scrupulosa uh, against lantana camera, and Crippolemus montrezeri against millibugs. So these are some of the important examples uh, I have been cited here because most of the times uh, you can find questions from these only, like uh, which one is the biocontrol agents of water hyacinth or Neochatina bruchi uh, has been imported from which uh, country to India. So different types of questions will might come from uh, this part or this table, we can say. So in the year 1963, the gall fly, fly that is your procedo uh, cheris utilis, uh, against Crofton weed, that is on Ageratum adenophora. Then uh, it has been imported from New Zealand to Nilgiris. Then three exotic ancestral parasitoids, uh, that is Acerophagus papai, Anagaris loci, and Pseudoleptomastis mexicana. It has been imported against the papaya millibug, that is Paracoccus marginatus. It, it was also a uh, South American paste that has been introduced into India. So to control that, again, three parasitoids has been introduced. So they have effectively controlled the uh, millibug, we can say. So these are uh, some of the important years uh, along with uh, some of the important uh, weed uh, control uh, insect agents. So that you have to remember. Yes. So uh, for an effective natural enemy, there are some attributes. Like first is your high searching capacity. Like the natural enemy must be able to search effectively among the all the hosts. That is the most important thing. Next is limited host specificity. Like uh, it must be monophagous or oligophagous. If it is polyphagous, then it is not that much effective. Third one is your high reproductive potential. Like it should be able to multiply and reproduce on its own in the field condition, uh, or we can say in all the adverse situations. Uh, the fourth one is like wider environmental tolerance. As uh, we know that biocontrol uh, is usually will directly apply the 
biocontrol agents in the field. So uh, the most uh, important feature of biocontrol agents is that they must be, uh, they have wider adaptability to the environmental extremes. Next is restriction of oviposition to suitable host. Like they will only oviposit or they must only oviposit in the suitable host. So uh, that their wastage of energy is avoided. Next is your amenability to insectary rearing. So under augmentation, I told that there are two aspects. One is your inoculation, another one is your inundation. So under both of these, we have to uh, mass multiply the natural enemies. Uh, later on in this slides, we'll discuss um, what are the different protocols and how to go for mass multiplication of natural enemies. So basic uh, criteria for an effective natural enemy is to, uh, they must be amenable to insectary rearing or mass multiplication. And they must be a density dependent performer. Like if the uh, insect population or pace population is more, so they must be able to kill at a higher rate or their performance should be more as compared. So that indicates their density dependent performance. Similarly, now uh, if we come to the next one, that is your good competitive ability. Like they must be able to outcompete the weaker ones. Like suppose in a field you are uh, releasing both Chrysoperla carnia as well as the coccinellid beetles. So they must be quite uh, competitive enough to uh, like uh, discard each other's presence. And in spite of each other's presence, they will be able to uh, like uh, control the pace population. So that is the next important criteria. Next is synchronization with the host and its habitat. Suppose when coccinellid beetle, its life cycle is uh, begins in the winter season. So it will control aphids only when the aphid will come in the winter season, not in the summer season. So that is uh, the term indicates that is synchronization with the host and its habitat. So if we come to the classification of parasitoids, so parasites can be grouped uh, into different types, like depending on the nature of the host, they may be zoophagus, phytophagus, entomophagus, or entomophagus insects. So uh, the zoophagus means, as a term, zoo means they will mainly attack the um, animals. We can say phagus means to eat or to grab. So zoophagus means they will attack the animals, like we can say the cattle paste. Next term is your phytophagus. Phytophagus means they will attack the plants like uh, our uh, crop paste. So next is our entomophagus, like uh, they will attack the insects. Entomo means insects, so they will attack the insects. Similarly, entomophagus insects, like uh, some insects will feed on the plants. So if any uh, other insect will attack the plant feeding insect, that is known as your parasitoids. So these are different uh, type of parasitoid depending upon the nature of the host. Next is, uh, it might be based on the specialization of the site of parasitization, like where it will parasitize. So on this basis, they might be classified into ectoparasites as well as endoparasites. So ecto means from outside they will parasitize and endo means from inside they will parasitize. So ectoparasites, they will attack the host from the outside of the body of the host. The mother parasite lays eggs on the body of the host from the outside. And after the eggs are being laid, uh, the has larva will feed on by on the host by remaining outside only. It won't move inside the cuticle of the host. So, for example, we can say the head louse, Epiricania melanolica, it is a parasitoid of uh, sugarcane pyrilla, epipyrospecies uh, that is on sugarcane fly. So, these are uh, different uh, type of uh, parasites that are considered as ectoparasites. Next one is your endoparasites. So, endo means inside, parasites means they will uh, depend on the host for the living. So they enter the body of the host and feeds from inside. The mother parasite either lays eggs inside the tissue of the host or on the food material of the host. And it will, it will gain entry into the uh, host. So what will happen? Like uh, inside the body, they will, body of the host, they will multiply. And from the uh, body of the host only, they, it will take the nutrition. So, for example, we can say the braconates, ichneumonates, as well as appendylis fabipes on Joar stem borer, that is your, uh, uh, we can say, the chylo larva. So, these are some of the important examples of ecto as well as endoparasites. Next is uh, based on the specialization uh, on the stage of the host, like which stage it is affecting. Uh, 
so we know that uh, we have heard that it is a egg parasite it is a larva parasite it is a mid larval parasite it is a pupal parasite it might be a you know, pre pupal or a uh, we can say nymphal or adult parasitoid so based on this uh, uh, the specialization or the stage of the host which is it attacks it might be egg early larval mid larval pre pupal or pupal parasite suppose we will consider the coconut black headed caterpillar like opisinia arenosella its egg parasite is your trichogamma australiacum and its early larval parasite is apentile staragamma then mid larval parasite is your bracon hepatur as well as pre pupal parasite is your gonigeus nephantridis and pre pupal one more is there that is elasmus nephantridis and if you come to pupal parasite it is your stromatocerus sulcatus scutellum as well as trichospilus pupivora and tetrastricus israeli so here you have to remember each uh, stage wise example why because uh, like suppose one objective will come like elasmus nephantridis is a uh das parasite of or parasitoid of opisinia arenosella so you have to remember the stage at which stage it infects or else the question might come like trichogamma australiacum yeah, it is a egg parasitoid of which insect so you must be able to write the coconut black headed caterpillar so gradually at the end of the slides we'll discuss few questions objective important questions for the grfsrf point of view so yes next next is your like i told uh, that uh, the egg parasitoids they might belong to trichogametidae cleonidae evanidae so these are three important families of egg parasitoids we can say and respectively the examples are like trichogamma kilonis on cotton bollworm trichogamma japonicum again rice stem borer that is cypripaga insatulus trichogamma akai against lepidoptera and pest and cleonidae uh, the example is uh, tilonemus remus against tobacco caterpillar as well as even your appendigaster on utheca of cockroaches so these are the important examples of egg parasitoid similarly if we come to what is the egg larval parasitoid it is um, belongs to usually ancitidae and braconidae so ancitidae means the it is a copidosoma coelidae on potted tuber moth as well as chilonus blackburni on spotted bollworm that is areas vitella as well as areas uh, insulana so you have to remember the families as well as one one examples from each because uh, this is one more uh, important question uh, in your grf or srf or any entomology related multiple choice type exams so larval parasitoids belongs to braconidae platygaster is today as well as your bethylidae and ichneumonidae so under braconidae what is your plutella on larva of diamond moth that is plutella gylostella bracon habitat bracon brevicornis on opisinia arenosella platygaster oryzae on larva of rice gallmis that is ursulia oryzae gonigeus nephantridis on coconut black headed caterpillar that is opisinia arenosella then ichneumonida if you see ichneumonida is the uh, one of the uh, largest parasitoid order we parasitoid family from hymenoptera we can say it is one more important objective question that is which one is the important uh, larger parasitoid family among the insects so answer is the ichneumonida uh, so uh, then uh, examples are like campylistus chloridi on helicobarpa armigera iriborus trochanteratus on coconut black headed caterpillar then uh, the next stage that is the larval pupal parasitoids examples are chalcididae ilophidae and ichneumonidae so chalcididae means the brachymeria nephantridis on pupa of black headed caterpillar trichospilus pupivora and tetrastricus israeli on the coconut black headed caterpillar similarly the ichneumonids that is your isotema javensis it is a pre pupal parasitoid of the top suit borer that is your uh, uh, top suit borer of sugarcane as well as cypripaga nivella then uh, the xanthopimpla punctata it is on pupa of coconut black headed caterpillar so these are uh, important larval pupal parasitoids of um, belonging to chalcididae ilophidae and ichneumonida so basically you have to remember again i am telling that like you have to remember the families as well as the irrespective examples so uh, next is a nymphal adult parasitoid like they belong to apelinidae or epiricanidae and epipyrtopidae so under apelinidae encarsia formosa uh it is uh, affecting the cotton white fly that is your bemisia tabaki we know that uh, a few years back in the year 2011 uh no sorry 16 there there was cotton white fly outbreak in punjab region so that time this uh, parasite formosa uh, it has severely controlled the cotton white fly 
so that uh, this white fly outbreak in punjab was not in a one year condition because it uh, for term it was uh, affecting the uh, cotton ecosystem in punjab so the next uh, aphelianid uh, nympha adult parasitoid is nastia perniciosa on quadrus pediotus perniciosa so one more important uh, parasitoid nympha adult parasitania melanoleuca on pyrilla purpusilla so yes the next one is just a minute am i audible everyone am i audible yes ma'am you are audible yes okay thank you so uh, next classification is depending upon the duration of attack uh it is uh, might be transitory parasite or permanent parasite so transitory means as the term indicate it will move from one uh, host to another host like it won't pick up to uh, one particular host only so it is not a permanent but transitory parasite which spends few its life in one host like suppose one uh, trichogamma we can say suppose trichogamma is although it is not a transitory for example i am telling like one braconid you can take so braconid it will spend one uh, insect and another stays in another insect because it will move from one host to another host the examples are braconids and ichneumonids similarly if you consider what are the permanent parasites the parasites which spend all the life stages in the same host it is known as the permanent that is your uh, like we can say head lobs so again uh, one more classification that is depend degree of parasitization uh they might uh, belong to uh, obligatory parasite or facultative obligatory parasite means parasite which can live only on a um, only as a parasite as a free living organism so for example bird lice and head lice are examples of uh, parasites but if you come to know that let like, like uh, what is your facultative parasite so parasites which can live away from the host at least for a shorter period they are known as a um faculty like for example fleas so next is depending upon the food habits they are classified polyphagous oligophagous and as well as monophagous so poly means uh, on different families of hosts like they will develop on number of widely different host species example bracon apentelis species on different lepidopteran caterpillars they will feed the next one is oligophagous uh, insects uh, which has very few host range that is isotema javensis it will feed on sugarcane borers as well as sorghum borers also so it has few host range but if we come to the monophagous uh, uh, parasitoids which has only one host species and it can't survive on another species that is they are host specific and for example uh, it is like gonigus nephantidis on opisinia arenosella so these are different examples uh, of parasitoid based on food habits so next one is with respect to affect on the host so affect on the host means like uh, they will affect uh, in it in two way like in one case after the parasitization the development of the host is arrested because the host development will be discontinued it will be stopped and in case of uh, one more example like in case of coenobant coenobant means after the parasitization the host development will continue like we can say here example like idiobants the host development arrested or terminated upon the parasitization because in case of egg parasitoid like trichogamma it will infect your egg stage of a lepidopteran larva after that the egg will die because it won't be able to continue to the larval stage again but in case of coenobant the host will continue to develop following the parasitization for example larval pupal parasitoid because if one larva will be parasitized uh, with uh, coenobant parasitoid what will happen it will continue to the pupal stage so that is the here continuation of life cycle occur here the life cycle will be stopped so that are the basic difference between your idiobanta as well as coenobant next one is with respect to the egg production so egg production means female uh, parasitoid mainly uh, the in case of parasitoids we know that like mosquitoes mainly the female bites so in case of uh, vectors also uh, the vector is not uh, gender specific like uh, in case of vector um, mainly the female also they used to uh, spread the diseases among the plants 
similarly in case of parasitoids they are egg-laying efficiency and because of their probing efficiency they are considered as more important as compared to the male counterparts so they are divided into two types that is your you know, pro-ovigenic as well as synovigenic so pro means before ovigenic means egg-laying syn means same ovigenic means egg-laying so before uh, they will uh, have all the complements of the eggs. So those species of Hymenoptera, which reach the adult stage with a complete complement of ripe eggs, which they deposit in short time, like from the earlier stages, like in case of adult, from the larval stages only, they will get all the nutrients to produce the eggs. They won't feed in the adult stage to produce the eggs. That is your pro-ovigenic. That is before they will get all the nutrient for egg laying. That is your pro-ovigenic. Similarly, synovigenic. During the adult stage, they will feed on the nutrition uh, to get the um, proper uh, acquirement for the uh, oviposition. Like the species uh, of Hymenoptera, which continue to produce eggs, throughout the adult stage and production of eggs is dependent on the nutrition of the adult female. You can see here that production of the eggs, it is dependent on the nutrition of the adult female rather than on the metabolites retained from the immature stages. So immature stages nutrition doesn't affect the egg-laying of a synovigenic parasitoid because here it depends only what the mother eats in the adult stage. So yes, that's all uh, with the types of parasitism. Again, we'll come to the kinds of parasitism. So kind is simple, super, multiple, and hyper. Simple means like one parasitoid, it will infect, it will lay uh, either single or multiple number of eggs only once. That is your simple parasitism. That is apparently sterogramming on the leaves, larva of Opicinia arenocella. Similarly, super means like a phenomenon of parasitization of an individual host by more than one larva of single species. Suppose, uh, like we can say, suppose A is a parasitoid and A, A, B, C are parasitoids. So A, B, C, they together will go and they will lay larva on the host species. Like we can say, Appendix glomeratus on Pyris brassica, Trichospilus pipivora on Opicinia arenocella. These are examples of super parasitism. So simple means one single individual will go and lay eggs, either one or multiple eggs. And super means uh, many eggs of a single individual will be laid. So from a single species, we can say. Multiple parasitism means uh, the parasitism, phenomenon of parasitism by different species of primary parasites at the same time. So we can say here like trichogamma, telonomus and testicus, all are egg parasitoids. So they will attack the eggs of paddy stem borer, that is your Kipopaka insatulus. So that is an example of multiple parasitism because all of them belongs to different family. So already I have shown you one parasitoid family table. So in that you can see that trichogamma belongs to trichogamma today, telonomus belongs to scleonidae, tetrasticus belongs to bethylidae, we can say. So these three parasitoids, they belong to different family, but they will attack the same host. That's why different family, same host, multiple parasitism. Same family, same host, that is super parasitism. And same family as well as a single host, that is simple parasitism. So the next cases are hyperparasitism. When a parasite itself it is attacked by another parasite that is known as your hyperparasitoid. So for example, Gonius nephantridis, it is parasitized. It is a, already a parasitoid we have seen here that Opicinia arenosola, it is being parasitized by Gonius nephantridis. So the Gonius nephantridis, if it is parasitized by again Tetrastricus israeli, uh, that is one more hyperparasitoid. So the condition is known as your hyperparasitism. So, uh, again, there are four important terms like primary parasites, secondary parasite, tertiary, as well as quaternary parasites. So, the primary parasites, a parasite, parasite attacking an insect, uh, which itself is not a parasite. Because uh, one insect is beneficial to man and the, uh, like one insect, uh, it is harming the paste, like suppose a uh, stem borer, we can say the trichogamma and the stem borer association. Here the trichogamma is the primary parasite. But if uh, one parasite, it will attack your trichogamma again, because trichogamma is the primary parasite, we already know. So a hyperparasite attacking the primary parasite, it is usually considered as harmful to man. So we can say in this way that primary parasite as well as tertiary parasites are harmful, beneficial to man, while the secondary as well as quaternary parasites, they are harmful to man. But in case of your beneficial insect or productive insects, we can say, uh, like uh, the 
uh, silkworms like bombyx mori and as well as your black insect that is caria laca the parasitoids are considered as harmful so the next situation that is your autoparasitism as well as uh, kleptoparasitism so autoparasitism means uh, in which the male of the species develop as a hyperparasite of the uh, female because like if the female will attack as a primary parasite and the male will attack the female of the same species so this condition is known as autoparasitism auto means the self only like the female is a primary parasite and the male is the secondary parasite on the female of the same species so this condition is known as the autoparasitism it is also known as heteronemus heteronemus means because the male and female of they will develop on different host so the next condition is the kleptoparasitism so klepto means like uh, they are not true hyperparasites because already they will attack the host which is being parasitized and weakened by another parasitoid so uh, usually the kleptoparasites they will win the competition and they will uh, finally infest the host so the autoparasitism as well as the kleptoparasitism these are two unusual type of situations even though it will occur you can find uh, autoparasitism in case of incarsia formosa and white fly uh, because incarsia formosa the female will attack first then the male of incarsia formosa it will attack your female species so next is like uh, the difference between predator and parasitoid so predators they are mostly generalized feeders they are very active in habits they have organs of low common sense but they are stronger and larger and usually more intelligent than the prey and uh, the habitat is independent of that prey they have a long life cycle they will attack the prey and uh, it is not well planned it will uh, seize and devour the prey rapidly so like uh, one tiger if will attack a man so main man is the prey and tiger is the predator so the attack on the prey for obtaining food and for attacking predator itself like a single predator may attack several hosts for a shorter period so these are the basic uh, um, criteria of a predator like you can take the example of tiger and human as i told so next one is your um, parasite so parasites uh, like we have already discussed different families so these are like uh, they will exhibit a host specialization in many cases uh, in the range of host species they will attack so uh, they will exhibit host specialization in many cases in the range of host species attack that is very much limited and they are usually sluggish uh, or sluggish that is one host is shifted then uh, it is not very well developed because the you know, organs are not very well developed and sometimes it is uh, reduced also only with uh, higher uh, highly developed ovipositor we can say and they have smaller as well as uh, um they are smaller as well as more intelligent than their host the habitat and the environment is made um, and determined by the uh, host only then the it is uh, usually short the life cycle is usually short and if we coming to if we discuss the how it will attack the prey so it is uh, like uh, planning is more here like we can say trichogamma attacking one stem borer here the planning is involved it is planning more here so next one is the how the life on, on uh, it will live on the body and the, it will kill the host in slow manner not like immediate killing like in case of i told tiger and human so the uh, next one is it is the parasite is it usually completes the development in a single host but in case of predators they will depend on many prey species so uh, like if we come to what are the behavior of the uh, host uh, selection or uh, prey selection in case of parasitoid or predators the behavior is mainly classified as three broad categories under salt classification first one is your ecological selection second one is your psychological selection third is your physiological selection ecological means first the predator will try to see whether the environmental conditions are suitable or not second one is psychological condition first the uh, in this condition the predator will try to uh, correlate like uh, whether the uh, host or the prey is in weak state or it is stronger so that it will estimate the psychology of the we can say uh, in normal language we can say like it will estimate the psychology of the prey next is your physiological selection physiological selection means if one uh, host or prey it is already diseased so it will it is that means it is already weak so if the parasitoid or predator will attack it that means it will be easier for to devour so that time that is the condition of physiological selection we can say so uh, like uh, the under host plant resistance you might have heard the five steps of how the host uh, 
a plant is being uh, found by the insects so similarly in case of uh, host uh, and uh, predator or we can say prey predator and host parasitoid relationship the host finding it involves host habitat finding host finding host acceptance host suitability so these are the four important steps of uh, host finding by the parasitoids so yes Next is the, uh, there are different examples uh, of uh, different predators. Like we can say they belongs to Coleoptera, Odonata, Dictyoptera, Neuroptera, Hemiptera, Lepidoptera, as well as Diptera. So all these examples you have to remember. Like uh, if you consider the soft-bodied insect and eggs of Lepidoptera, and the coccinellid beetles, Cicinellidae, Carabidae, they are the predators. So you know, like if you consider the caterpillar as well as the grasshoppers, the Mantodia, they belong to the uh, Dictyoptera. We can say mantids. Um, they are the predators. So similarly, the next case, like the uh, trisopids and hermerobids, they belong to Neuroptera. They are the predators of uh, aphids, scale, mealybugs, and as well as eggs of Lepidoptera. So the next is, sorry. Yes, uh, the next is uh, like uh, different myriads, riduvids, pentatomids, they belong to Hemiptera as well as they are uh, predators. Like uh, Citrodinus libidipenis, we know that this is a predator of BPH. Platymeris levicollis, it is a riduvid bug. And you can think of a it is a uh, pentatomid that is predicting on the caterpillars. So the next is like Lepidoptera, we can see that uh, the Epipyropidae, that is your uh, Typha aphidibora, it predates on aphids. Furthermore, like uh, we know that rubber fly, seerfid fly belongs to uh, seerfidae, rubber fly belongs to acidity. They are also predating on the small insects. So these are the major uh, predatory orders along with the families and the examples that you have to remember for the objective point of view. Next is your biological control of weeds. Like a uh, few important uh, citations of weeds I have given here. Like if, if it is the lantana weed, it is controlled uh, by your Octochroma stapipenis, Ophiomia lantani, Philonomia scrupulosa. Prickly pear, it is controlled by Dacalopius tomentosus, Mitosa tetranica species. Alligator weed, that is Alternatra phylloxerus, it is controlled by Agastris hygrophylla. Then one aquatic weeds, uh, mainly they are controlled by Cyprimus caprio, that is Chinese carp and common carp. So you have to remember the first three are most important. This uh, aquatic weed it usually doesn't come for exams. Submerged weed, weed also it is not that much important, but as it is a successful example, so I have cited here. So uh, Congress of Carrot Weed that is Parthenium hysterochorus, it will uh, mainly be fed by the Jagurama bicolorata. Similarly, your procedural gerus utilis, it will feed on Eupatorium adenoporum, pareochetus pseudoinsulata, uh, that is your siam weed, uh, it will control siam weed, and your cytobaga singularis, it will control the water fawn. As well as neochetina aquini, neochetina bruci, orthogonal trenebranis, they will control water hyacinth. So these are uh, most important examples of uh, different uh, biocontrol agents of your weeds. That is, uh, in every exam, you can find uh, one or two questions from these tables. Like already I have cited uh, many tables. So uh, if each table you will observe and you will go side by side, you will go doing the questions and multiple choice types. So you will, from these tables only, you will find at least 20 to 30 questions. So yes, next one is like, uh, there are a few uh, successful uh, examples uh, in India. Uh, like uh, we have imported many natural enemies from outside. Like in case of apple to control Uli aphid and Sanju scale, we have imported uh, Apollinus mali as well as Incarcia paniciosi from England and China respectively. In case of coconut, we have imported uh, Platymeris levicalis, Provosia uh, bejiana from Zanzibar and Sri Lanka respectively, as well as potato tuber moth. Uh, it has been uh, controlled by Bracon gallici, Chelinus bracconi, as well as Copidosoma quelleri from Canada, Hawaii, as well as Peru. So a part you have to remember here, like the imported country you have to remember here and the scientific name of the uh, paste as well as common name of the paste as well as the natural enemy also. So one more thing I'd like to uh, tell you here, uh, this is not only uh, from the biocontrol perspective, like if you are uh, reading entomology, try to read the scientific names properly, like in an easy way. Don't try to engulf like, no, uh, it is uh, looking very difficult. So it seems very difficult. I won't remember this. No, it's like your uh, identity, like myself without my identity, you won't identify me or you won't uh, recognize me that who am I? Similarly for insects also, like they also need identity because uh, like uh, there without any identity, it is in vain. So similarly, uh, you have to uh, remember the scientific names as well as the common names of the all the insects. 
So yes. Next one is your uh, next topic that is microbial control. So microbial insecticides, they are mainly single cell organisms such as bacteria, fungi, protozoa, viruses. So they are mass produced. So either they directly or there are any formulations they are being used in control methods. So all these microbial control methods, they are coming under your uh, Environmental Protection Agency or EPA and it is governed by uh, FIPRA, we can say, that is Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodent Insecticide Act in world level. So what are the characters of microbial insecticides? They should be virulent and cause disease uh, to based at recommended concentration. Should not be sensitive uh, to environmental variation. Then they should be uh, rapidly established uh, disease in the paste population. Then this must be specific to paste population so as to, uh, there will be less than non-target effect. So they, uh, the microbial control agents, they might be classified as potential pathogen, facultative pathogen, as well as your obligate pathogen. So potential pathogen means the microorganisms that are capable of invading the host, either through the body wall or through the digestive tract without assistance. You have to remember here the term without assistance means they are potential enough. They will invade the uh, host themselves. They don't need any kind of uh, other assistance. But in case of facultative pathogen, uh, they don't require any kind of insect that is weakened by external factors to cause the infection. But if you come to the obligate pathogens, they are microorganisms, they require leading host for the survival as well as the development of the uh, host. So these are the three different types of uh, microbial agents like potential pathogen, facultative pathogen, as well as the obligate pathogen. So we can, if you consider uh, like BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, it is a facultative pathogen, but Bacillus populi, it is an obligate pathogen. Okay, so just you have to remember the example. So yes, uh, next is the bacterial pesticide. First one, we'll discuss the bacteria because uh, the bacterial pesticides, they have uh, dominated the pesticide, uh, microbial pesticide market. So in this context, like the Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, it will mainly control the lepidopteran paste. It is non-sporing type and has been, um, uh, it is spore-forming spore type, while the Seracea marcescens, it is your non-sporing type. So first it was uh, isolated uh, as a stomach poison in the year 1902 from the disease larva of silkworm that is Bombyx mori in Japan by Ishiwata. So this is one more most important question in each exam you might find either of these like 1902 uh, where, from which it, it was isolated and who has isolated and when it was discovered. So there are two questions one is in uh, 1902 another one is in 1915. Berliner has isolated sporulating bacteria from the Mediterranean floor moth, that is your Nephistia quenella in Thuringian. So just because of the name Thuringian, it has been renamed as Bacillus thuringiensis. So the BT was first used as an insecticide against your European corn borer, that is Ostronia nobilis, in the year 1930. Uh, similarly, there are different stereotypes, like we can say Israelensis is there. So Israelensis was isolated by Goldberg and Margalich. So you have to remember the names like who is the person or scientist associated with particular serotype or biotype. Then uh, next is BT tenebriensis. Tenebriensis is mainly effective against coleopterans and it was isolated by Craig et al. in the year 1982 from dead milliwarm pupa. So one important strain that is your HD1 strain it was isolated by in the year 1970. So we can, these are the some of the important historical developments from the bacterial pesticide point of view. So yes. So how the uh, bacterial insecticides act, means how the BT will act. So basically the first step is ingestion, second one is dissolution, third is activation of protein, fourth one is your binding to specific receptors, fifth one, one is vacuolation of the cytoplasm. So uh, first is ingestion, like one uh, crystal protein or we can say pre-toxin, it will be ingested by the larva. And inside the larval midgut, it will reach, uh, there will be alkaline pH. And due to the alkaline pH and different uh, digestive enzymes, there will be the dissolution of the protein crystals because the pre-toxin that is of nearly 120 kilodalton, it will be converted into nearly half, that is your 58 to 60 kilodalton of toxin. Then the activation of protein will occur, that is the crystal will activate it into alpha toxin, then finally it will be activated into toxin. So after that, there are different receptors, like we can say alkaline phosphatase, amino phosphatase, then uh, your like uh, catherine receptors. So there are different receptors. 
to this the beta toxin will bind then it will cause the pore formation in the peritrophic membrane of the midgut so what will happen the outside and inside ionic balance will be disrupted that will leads to ultimate vacuolation of the cytoplasm as well as the cell disruption so this is the basic mode of action of the uh, back, uh, bacillus thuringiensis according to shunman et al this uh, figure i have taken from shunman et al in the year uh, 2012 so coming to the next one so there are different other species like uh, bt kushta it is uh, lepidoptera specific bt gallery it is lepidoptera specific bt tenebrensis as i told it is coleoptera specific as well as your bt israelensis it is diptera specific bacillus pericus it is uh, effective against mosquitoes as well as your black flies bacillus uh, thuringiensis uh, agy it is uh, caterpillars is lepidoptera specific and sandia it is mainly effective against your cold or hot or bitter so this figure um, Uh, it is mainly denotes the classification like there are some bacteria that is aerobic there are some anaerobic so under aerobic again some are spore formers some are non spore formers so against spore formers some are obligate like bacillus populi i told some are facultative so facultative might be cristalliferous or acristalliferous that is your bacillus thuringiensis is cristalliferous as well as bacillus cereus is acristalliferous and if you come to non spore formers they might be potential or facultative so potential means uh, they are uh, pseudomonas or acrobacter as well as your facultative means there is seracia species so this classification is most important you have to remember to do any uh, kind of objective from the classification of entomopathogenic bacteria so yes yeah. the next slide these are some of the important strains of uh, the bt that is bt kushta ki different strains are there in the formulation that has been registered under insecticide act 1968 bt gallery bt israelensis some of the important strains again you have to remember the strain name as well as the formulation like suppose one question might come strain hd1 is a uh, strain of bt which subspecies so you have to write the kushta ki kushta ki is the subspecies here similarly serotype 3a is a bt gallery strain similarly if we come to vcrc b17 it is israelensis subspecies okay so uh, from this you have to remember the subspecies and strain type so yes just a minute yes so the next one like uh, what are the current status of bt crops in india so bt cotton is only uh, widely genetically accepted Uh, modified crop across the indian uh, subcontinent it is grown over 10.8 million hectares and it is most important because gradually uh, bt cotton has developed resistance and that is bolgar 1 has developed resistance so bolgar 2 have developed similarly after bolgar 2 bolgar 3 is also now under process so we can see uh, only but in uh, bt cotton only uh, bt cotton is the only single accepted crop next one is the bt brinjal so bt brinjal it is a uh, uh, like uh, under gesc uh, it is uh, recommended for cultivation because it is already approved in bangladesh but uh, in india it is not at approved um, and it was developed by mahiko uh, that is maharashtra hybrid seed company in collaboration with dharwad university of agriculture science and tamil nadu agriculture university next one is your gm mustard that is dhara mustard hybrid 11 or dmh 11 it is developed by um, former uh, chancellor of uh, delhi university deepak pentel uh, by genetically modifying the mustard variety varuna so uh, the field trials for 21 gm food crops including gm vegetables as well as cereals have been approved but only bt cotton has been commercialized across india next is if you come to the regulatory aspects of bio uh, genetically modified crops that is your top biotech regulator in india is the genetic engineering appraisal committee so we have to remember the name that is the gesc is the top authority and it will uh, function under the act environment protection act of 1986 as well as the ministry of environment and forest is governing body of this that is ministry of environment and forest uh, it will govern this similarly the rule that is environment protection act 1986 under the rule 1989 it will, it is responsible for governing the biotech crops so yes is that clear everyone till now yes is that clear everyone till now students please interact with the madam Sorry, sir. Can you a bit louder? Yes, students. I am requesting to, to the students to interact with you. 
yes dear students do you have any doubts dear students if any doubt just let me know because after this i will go go with the multiplication of biocontrol agents that is different part so if any doubt let me know yes students please respond no ma'am okay, okay. so ma'am can you, you can continue okay okay ma'am i'll continue okay so next part is the entomopathogenic virus so viruses are coming uh, second after the uh, like we can say uh, bacteria so they might be nucleic polyhedrosis viruses or can be abbreviated as npv cytoplasmic polyhedrosis virus or cpv as well as granulosis viruses or gv mainly the npv are widely used so the polyhedrosis viruses we can see uh, like uh, the the npv the virus particles they can be enveloped by single or group of occluded protein bodies and they will multiply in the cell nucleus so as a multiplication site is a nucleus or the epidermis that's why the nuclear polyhedrosis virus name so they are specific uh, uh, usually for host but only in case of autocalifonica anagrafa falsifera as well as pamestra brassicae they are not host specific but if you come like the symptoms how they will cause so there is a typical symptom of tree top disease because in case of uh, any infection the infected larva will climb to the top of the tree and that position and it will hang upside down so that position is not known as tree top disease or else uh, it fell crankate so the charcoal is added usually to npv as a uv protectant uh, and the first npv product in india is elcar registered in the year 1973 these are uh, already i have highlighted here at right? the uh, handouts also of this notes uh, these uh, these uh, whatever the highlights are important from each point of view similarly the next one is uh, cyto plasmic polyhedrosis viruses here the multiplication site of the virions are inside the columnar cell of the midgut epithelium so the name that is cytoplasmic polyhedrosis viruses and uh, it tells that uh, the npv how it will affect similar to the bt it will also require your alkaline ph and uh, you can see here the polyhedra with embedded virions and it will uh, lead to the alkaline ph will lead to the dissolution of polyhedra and releasing of virions and breakdown of the peritrophic membrane and uh, ultimately it will lead to the uh, osmotic imbalance and death of the heart so uh, there are some important uh, like uh, your uh, npv ha npv we can say sl npv against protoplasma a albistrica vpn 80 it is against autograph of california protoplasma it is Products that is product are exigua, elka that is uh, against elka gene, cirrus or agrovir, PTM viruses. They are uh, entomopathogenic viruses. So next is your fungi. First pathogen to they found to cause the diseases in insects. So main uh, mode of action. it can come here directly yes so we can see that the fungus it will produce the aerial conidia and of the insect so gradually the conidia it will land on the uh, aerial spore it will disperse on ac across the land on the insect cuticle then after that the spore will germinate and penetrate into the cell so after this uh, the fungus grows throughout the body as the black as well as mycelium uh, killing insects uh, within the 4 to 14 days so we can say that within the um, mycelial growth might be visible on outside of the body of the larva so the entomopathogenic virus uh, fungi we can see here that the spore addition to the then how the germination spore occur here then how the apf Uh, has grown in muscle of the body then how it leads to insect death and the epf sporulation and ultimately there will be so in case of uh, bacteria and virus infection there will be liquefaction of the body and there will be uh, occlusal bodies but uh, here uh, we can say we will find infection we will find the mummified larva so here uh, there are some of the important of uh, fungus like uh, against different major insects like microtol naturalis 
then bios of mycoj also these are formulations of bivaria bassiana similarly bivaria bronchiarti these are then injured cells and meconon these are some of the formulations against the scarab beetle larva remember here that bivaria bronchiarti is effective against which insect the scar it will effective against scarab beetle similarly metarism anisoply metarism flavoberidy as well as verticillium lecani it will mainly effective against your that is your aphid white fly thrips gels mealybugs furthermore pestilomyces fimus it is effective against white flies as well as thrips so these are the importance of the tables here you have to remember yes so next one is entomopathogenic nematodes so basically we know that plant pathogenic nematodes are there they will infect the plant and they will cause galls or other types of uh, disease like symptoms and they will uh, cause the damage but if you uh, come to the entomopathogenic nematodes so entomopathogenic nematodes are soil inhabiting Uh, entomopathogenic nematodes are soil inhabiting and lethal insects parasites that will belong to the phylum nematoda from the families mainly stener nematida and heteroraptida like we can say that uh, the nematodes belongs to these two families along with the uh, um, enterobacteria and bacteria they will get associated and they will cause the damage so uh, basically the examples are like genoraptors and the photoraptors this is so uh, stener nematida along with genoraptors and heteroraptida along with photoraptors they will cause the uh, uh, damage to the Uh, insects, or uh, we can say pests. Similarly, the third stage juvenile stage of EPNs, it is referred as your infective juveniles, that is your IJ, or the dwarf stage. In the next slide, we'll discuss how they will cause the damage. Yes. So we can see here the infective juveniles of the endomorphic nematodes, and how after this they will infect the larva, and what they will cause. A, the juveniles along with the association with the genoraptors and photoraptors species they will kill the inside good bacteria or we can say mutualistic bacteria and they will uh, cause the larva or insect body degradation and finally it will lead to the death of the larva so if we see here like in the soil there are three living uh, infective juveniles along with your bacteria so along with the stenonema with uh, genoraptors and uh, heteroraptors with photoraptors the mutualistic association lead to the pathogenic interaction and ultimately what will happen it will penetrate into the host the bacteria will be released and it will multiply and then the infective juveniles uh, it will uh, grow there and reproduce there and it will lead to development there and uh, ultimately the multiplication and production of uh, infective juveniles will occur and thus the insect and soil both in insect and soil uh, the entomopathogenic nematode it will cause the life cycle so next one is like if we come to the phases like how the you know, phase of the insect will come here like the phoretic phase pathogenic phase as well as saprophytic phase so phoretic phase means this phase it will go for phoresis like the bacteria it will attach itself to the nematode body but it doesn't cause the damage only it will attach itself to the nematode body but if we come to the pathogenic phase pathogenic phase in this phase what will happen it is a mutualism phase like uh, the bacteria it will cause association with the nematode body and saprophytic phase it will invade the insect body it will cause uh, death of the body and during which the nematode bacteria reproduce uh, in the cadaver So these are the three important phases of the entomopathogenic nematode and infestation. If we come to the you know, what are the formulations effective uh, against your uh, uh, insect phase nematode formulation that is Stenonema carpocarpi against Lepidopteran larva, Stenonema felti against Dipteris insect as well as Stenonema scapteriski against adult mole cricket as well as Heterobacteris bacteriophora against soil dwelling, dwelling insect. Similarly, next agents are the protozoans. Mainly, they belongs to amoeba, gregarians, flagellates, as well as your ciliates. So, Malpighi amoeba, Meliferi, or Malaria locusti, they are uh, damaging the honeybees as well as locust. Similarly, the gregarians, they they might be Matisia or Adenella species. They will cause damage to Orthoptera, Embryoptera, Diptera, as well as Columbola. And the flagellates, they are like your Trypanosoma brucei. They are parasitic protists. They will cause African trypanosomiasis, or we can say sleeping sickness. Furthermore, the ciliates belongs to tetrahymenidae. They will cause pathogenic diseases. Next one is the genetic control that we will discuss further detail in the innovative approaches. That is uh, next lecture. Um, just today, I will give a brief overview. That is, it was first propounded by E. F. Nipling.
uh, in the year 1937 and the insect used was cattle screw worm that is Pocleomia hominivorax and cattle screw worm the females are monogamous means they will mate only once that is the typical behavior of the cattle screw worm that's why they are amenable for genetically controlling so uh, like we can say there are uh, chemostradulants that are coming under your genetic control that are chemicals which deprive insects of the ability to produce that may be alkylating agents, antimalic metabolites or miscellaneous agents. So alkylating agents are aphoric, apomide, aphoxide that are male, female chemostradulant means they will affect more, both male as well as female insects. And your antimetabolites, they are only affecting female chemostradulants like uh, they will interfere the bio or metabolite synthesis then the miscellaneous agents like your hemp and hemel they are mainly the male chemostrelant so we'll discuss this in detail in the innovative uh, pest control lecture next one is the most important part that is your mass multiplication of biocontrol agents so mass multiplication why we need mass to mass multiply we know that we have to release artificially the biocontrol agents in the field in case of biological control so we have to maintain the culture for regular uh, release in the field because we know that they are uh, highly um, influenced by the uh, abiotic or environmental factors. That's why we need to maintain the culture in lab itself. So here I have uh, taken a few posters from NIPHM site that is National Institute of Plant Health Management, Hyderabad. So here you can see that mass production of bracken hepatitis. Here the host they have used is the Corsaida cetronica or we can say rice moth and how they have multiplied the bracken hepatitis or bracken brevicornis by using tub method and this is your sandwich method. So what is the first step you can see? They have taken one clean and dry tub and one cotton swab is placed or deep in solution. You can see here the cotton swab and then after that 50 to 250 gram of broken sorghum grains were added to this as a uh, food for the Corsaira larva. Then after that, uh, uh, 400 to 1000 Corsaira larva are, uh, that is in the second, third, fourth and fifth insta larva. So one important question here is how many larval instars are the Corsaira cephalonica? So there are total five larval instars in the Corsaira. So uh, they are released on the sorghum substrate. Then after that, um, we have to add 50 to 100 bracken adults then they will grow and multiply on the Corsair larva and again you have to collect the larva that are already being parasitized so this is the basic term method for the mass multiplication or mass production of the bracken habitat similarly if we go to the sandwich method like we can see start from here take a wide mouth jar and they there will be uh, placing a cotton swab in the 10 percent honey solution 30 to 50 male as, as female adult will be released. Then uh, we have to cover by using a muslin cloth. After that, 10 to 15 uh, Corsair bigger larva were uh, incorporated above the cloth. And after that, one more cloth is also covered. And in between these, what will happen? Like the bracon will, bracon is a larval predator, no? parasitoid. So it will uh, multiply and it will parasitize the larva of Corsair cephalonica. So yes. Next one is, Next one is for mass production of spider. So we know that spider and rudewood bugs are also predators. So uh, first we have to take uh, like one, two liter plastic container. You have to um, keep a few like small tweaks there. Then a place, you can place the whole setup in the plastic container, bigger plastic container. Then you can add three to five parts or a larva in the container. After that, uh, you can release one female that is mated spider in the container and cover it with a muslin cloth. And at last, uh, it will lay eggs and the eggs will hatch into spiderlings within 28 days. So these are the simple and uh, effective mass production procedure for the spiders. Similarly, if we mass production of redubid bugs, like uh, we can uh, fill a tube um, with sterilized sand and we can uh, place one honey um, cotton swab. Then we, you have to place the corrugated paper there and in that in between the paper you have to release the corsair larva similarly uh, you have to add one is to one like one male and one female pair of adult of uh, uh, like corsair then next you have to cover the tube with a muslin cloth next is uh, like you have to um, collect the egg mass in the petri dish and maintain the first instar of the redubid bug in the petri dish and at last we have to transfer uh, the redubid bugs into a tub and the adult will develop within 45 to 50 days like this is the circle of the mass production of the redubid bugs 
Similarly, how uh, to uh, rear Chrysopella carnea? So, Chrysopella carnea is also reared on the factitious host, that is costa, because usually Chrysopella carnea is uh, uh, not infecting in the field condition, the Corsera cephalotica, but for laboratory rearing, we have to use the Corsera. So, what you have to do, like, uh, then we, you can use either diets or you can use the Corsera larva directly. So, uh, there is the first instar, second and third instar of the Corsera Chrysopella. And you have to harvest the pupa then after that it will be lead to adult emergence and you have to keep the adult uh, in the oviposition case and at last it will lay stalk eggs so chrysopella lay stalk eggs that is the typical feature of chrysopella carnea so yes. what is the typical procedure the inflation of corsera cephalonica eggs then after the 34 days there will be uh, like uh, multiplication and the larva will turn into pupa after nine days it will turn into adult after seven days then it will uh, the adult will oviposit it and the eggs will be collected and the eggs they will be exposed to uv rays for sterilization because if you won't sterilize uh, from this the parasitization will be infected then the uh, eggs that are being sterilized that, that will be pasted on the egg card that is trichocard then the parasitizing trichocard with the trichogramma and then it will be stored um, at the uh, constant temperature of, uh, we can say, stored temperature of the refrigerated temperature of 5 to 6 degrees Celsius. These are the basic protocols. So yes, from this uh, mass multiplication, what are the important questions? Like which one is the uh, host uh, used for mass rearing? Mostly the Corsata cephalonica has been used. Till now, whatever I have discussed here, the Corsata cephalonica has been used as a factitious host. So factitious host means Usually, uh, the host is not attacked by the natural enemy in the field, but when for mass rearing, you are taking it uh, because of its some good efficiencies, we are taking it for, for mass rearing. So, yes, just a minute. Yes. So now how to go for mass production of trichogamma? Like you can see here, it is a 15 to 20 centimeter size of trichocard. So these cards are pre-punched. Like you have to cut it and you have to, you can see here how the small pieces has been pasted in the central holes of the rice field. So trichogamma in the ratio of eight into one, they have been released in the glass jar. Then the, each trichocard will contain about 20,000 parasitized eggs. So the parasitized eggs means 20,000 eggs. Usually it will be considered as one cc. That is one uh, Corsair equivalent, we can say. So after parasitism, six days old parasitoid egg cards is usually used in the feed. So uh, one trichocard that is having, means entire trichocard is having 20,000 eggs. It will be cut into 40 small pieces of 5 into 0.75 centimeter and it will be placed in the sugarcane, sorghum or maize fits. So yes, next is the millibug. How to uh, rear, uh, because... Uh, if you want to rear uh, Cryptolemus montrosary, we know it is a predator. So for this, you have to rear the host also. So uh, one process is uh, you can rear the millibug on potato. Uh, these are the processes. Like uh, you can uh, rear it either on potato or in this. We can see uh, that uh, just a minute. Yes, uh, on pumpkin, how it has been exploited for rearing of millibugs. So basically, either on potato or on pumpkins, you can use uh, or you can multiply the millibugs. Then what happened then the uh, predator that is cryptolemus montrosary will be mass reared that is when the millibugs are at 8 to 10 days old a stock of 15 to 12, 20 uh, females of cryptolemus montrosary will be released then the released females will feed on the bugs nymph and eggs as well and and also adult then the female deposit the egg on pumpkins like the cryptolemus montrosary will deposit the egg on pumpkins and on hatching the larva of the predator it will feed on the uh, your uh, millibugs. So the uh, fully developed larva with millibugs, uh, you can place in the plastic jar. Here he is placing it in, it in the plastic jar and the emerging beetles can be collected from the plastic bowl and fed with honey agar or, or on directly on millibugs. So these are the basic uh, protocol for rearing predator. So uh, is that clear everyone? Till now? because uh, I have completed most uh, part of the today's presentation, just multiple choice type questions few are there I want to discuss. So is it clear everyone? Yes, yes or no? 
okay uh, so i have uh, given here a few important questions like does uh, which of the following uh, scientists use first the term biological control so answer is h s smith in the year 1919 then who distinguished the term natural control from biological control uh, the answer is paul de back in the year 1964 so the next question is like the maintenance of a more or less fluctuating population density of an organism within a certain definable upper and lower limit is known as natural control so like similar pattern questions you can expect uh, for your grf srf as well as net exams because nowadays earlier what was there like uh, directly they used to uh, put questions from any random books but now it is what is happening like there must be some conceptual questions so you have to understand the concept as well as you have to um trickily remember whatever the things i told today so there are next questions like uh, who defined applied biological control so answer is van den bosch so applied biological control can be defined into uh, classical augmentation as well as conservation next is your in which year the chinese people they first used red ant so in 1900 ad this is most important question in uh, in each alternate year or in any objective book you can uh, find this type of questions like i personally i have formulated this, these questions for uh, like a compilation but these are most of the important questions again you can refer like in das uh, in the year das the aldrovandi they noted hymenopteran parasites so the answer is 1602 similarly uh, just a minute yes so uh, first insect pathogen was uh, recorded in which year 1726 an indian mina bird it was exported from india in the which year that is year 1762 and in uh, year dash the bedbug simex lecturalis it was successfully uh, controlled in the year 1776 similarly the vedalia beetle rodelia cardinalis it was uh, brought from australia and introduced into california so it is most important already the case study i have shown you uh, it is in the year 1888 similarly uh, like i have shown you one uh, table where uh, there is list of uh, natural enemies along with their uh, host so uh, the castor semilupar is a egg parasitoid of uh, the egg parasitoid is telonomus and uh, it is effective against castor semilupar and in the year 1964 paul de back and uh, ebert i spinner they have published a book so see one more thing like whenever you are reading any chapter like suppose you are reading physiology insect physiology so try to memorize a few important and authenticated book written by well known authors like biological control of insect pests and weeds it is written by paul de back and ebert uh, eisner so it is one of the important books similarly next is in the year 1965 the platymeris levicollis it is important to control uh, which pests in coconut so these you have to do uh, there are some of the important questions i have kept totally 20 questions for your reference uh, like uh, this is a predator with chewing mouth uh, type of mouth parts like we know that predators have chewing they might be chewing uh, biting type mouth parts they might be have sucking type of mouth parts so that is again in that objective part i have kept here you can see and uh, like uh, based on the monophagous oligophagous or polyphagous predator which type of predator it is so these are some of the important questions and like each table i have mentioned in the presentation it contains uh, numerous questions for your objective uh, for the grf srf as well as your different uh, multiple choice type exams so that's all uh, any doubts you can ask uh, thank you Um, please share ppt ma'am uh yes